In this video, we're going to be studying or simulating an AC coupled common source amplifier using T-SPICE. I have a pin cast here that we're going to reference. It's going to be linked on this video. It's number 4.8 and uh, it shows the schematic that we're going to be using. So we're going to enter the net list rather than drawing a schematic. So we'll go through that now. We will have a line for each component beginning with BI, the voltage source, on the input. Now to get the syntax for a sinusoidal input, we're going to use the uh, reference manual PSPCREF. That's a PSPICE reference manual. You can Google that online. The version of PSPICE that I'm using I think is 16.5, but this manual is from version 9 or so. It's a long time ago, but it's just as relevant to today, so and I like the layout. So we're going to look under the analog device area and on this page there is a list of all the components and we're looking for V for voltage source. Click on that and it takes us to the independent voltage source page and then it points us to the independent current source page because the syntax is the same. Now there are a lot of different types of uh, independent sources. You see them listed here, exponential sources, pulses, piecewise linear, um, frequency modulated waveforms, and then sinusoidal waveforms. And the sinusoidal is what we are looking for here. This will be the input to our amplifier. So here we go. We specify an offset, an amplitude, a frequency, a delay, a dissipation factor, and a phase. Some of those are optional and we won't list all of them. So we'll begin with the offset, put a one volt offset just for fun, a 10 millivolt amplitude, and then a one kilohertz frequency, and we won't specify the remaining parameters. Now VI here is shown being connected between VI and G, the gate. It really needs to be ground. I'll correct that in a second. The second component is the second component is uh, C1, and it goes from I to G, the gate, the MOSFET gate. I could call these nodes anything, but I'm just, um, I'm going to call it G because it's easy to remember that it's the gate. The capacitance value should be very large. I put 100 millifarad. One warning, a caution, is don't put 1F farad because it will interpret F as femto, as in uh, 10 to the minus um, 15. So you want to make sure that you specify something like what I've done here is 100 millifarad, which is 0.1 farad. We're going to add our voltage source, VDD, which powers the amplifier. It goes from a node DD, that'll be our supply rail, to ground. And I'm looking now for the value that I specified in this pin cast, and it's 30 volts. We then uh, have two resistors that provide a voltage divider to the gate and bias the gate up. One is RD, R1. It goes from DD, the supply rail, to um, the gate, and the other one goes from the gate to ground. Then we have the drain resistance, which goes from the supply rail to the drain. And that's 5K. And then lastly, we have the MOSFET, which uh, we have to look up in our manual for the syntax. So under analog devices, uh, scroll down looking for a MOSFET, it's uh, M. And the syntax here is that you specify the MOSFET name beginning with M. That's how SPICE knows that it's a MOSFET. But you specify the drain, then the gate, then the source, then the bulk uh, nodes, and then lastly the model name. So the drain is connected to a node that we'll call D for drain. Gate is connected to a node called G for gate. And then the sources, the source and the bulk, will both be connected to ground. So we'll put 0 and 0. The name of the model that I'm going to define is just my2n7000. We'll have to specify that model shortly. We have two more components to add. One is the output uh, DC blocking capacitor C2, which goes between the drain and an output node uh, labeled O. And again, that's a large capacitor. And then we have the load resistance, which goes between the output node O and ground. <clears throat> and instead of specifying the actual resistance, I've actually put a parameter R load. I put it in curly brackets, and then we add a dot param statement where we define the value of the load. 
here it's specified in our pencast as being 10K. This is not necessary, but if you want to later run a simulation where you're going to sweep a parameter and look at how, for instance, the gain changes as a function of the load, then you want to define the load resistance as a parameter, and it makes it easier to sweep that parameter. We then need to specify what kind of simulation we're going to run, and we're going to run a time domain simulation, which is called a dot trans simulation. We'll go to the um, manual. I thought I was going to the manual. Okay, to specify to look up the syntax, but you can you can look up the, the syntax if you need it. the uh, The order of those parameters are the first is a print step, which we're actually not using, but you have to specify because it's the first parameter. Second parameter is how long you want to run the simulation. We're going to run it for 10 milliseconds. The third parameter is the no print value. So if you only want to see the last two milliseconds, you can put eight milliseconds there. I've got zero because I want to see all of it. And then the last parameter is 0 0.01 milliseconds, which is the maximum time step. The last two parameters are optional, so you can try leaving them off, but sometimes you have to reduce the, you have to specify maximum time step, otherwise the simulator takes too big of steps and uh, the waveforms look choppy rather than smooth. Finally, we need to specify uh, the dot probe command, which says once you're done with the simulation, bring up the probe post processor so we can plot some waveforms and see the response. And all simulations end with a dot end statement. So now we're going to save it, um, and then once it's saved, we actually have to load it as a simulation. So it's not loaded as a simulation yet. So we'll do open simulation. We're going to filter on a .cir because that's how we saved we saved it as a .cir file. We find it and then load it. And uh, once it is loaded, here we go. Uh, we see up in the uh, little window. Uh, uh, on that menu bar that it shows the name of the simulation, so right by the, to the left of the play button. So we'll click the play button, and now it's simulating. We found that we have an error, so there's a new tab that comes up. It looks a lot like the circuit file that we typed in, but it's a .out file, and it first shows us what our circuit file is, and the net list, and the commands, and then it's going to show us where the error is. And here we see the error is that there is no model for my 2N7000. So we're going to go back and add that. So we have a dot model statement, and now let's go to our reference manual, and we're going to look up uh, our dot model statement and see how we specify that. So dot model uh, begins with a model name that you make up, and then uh, you're going to uh, list the, the type of device, which is a keyword that spe spice specifies, and then whatever parameters go with that spice model. So we're going to use a, we want a MOS, uh, MOSFET model, and you see here there is the, the fourth example there is a, an uh, NMOS is the type of device, so we're going to type that in. So my 2N7000 is the name that I gave it, we'll put NMOS, and then parentheses, and we're going to specify whatever models, model parameters that we're interested in. So now I'm actually going to go to the MOSFET um, section of the manual, and we're going to scroll down until we find um, uh, the uh, the parameters now the MOSFET uh, the MOSFET has many different levels of models there are seven of them here and it gets pretty complicated we're going to stick to level one model parameters and only use two of the multiple ones so uh, you basically just have to look for the things you're looking for and ignore all the rest so here's a list of uh, some of the parameters and I see here KP is the transconductance coefficient so that's the K value in our um, and our, our saturation equation, K over, and, and then the other one is the threshold voltage, so let's find that. It's listed as VTO, uh, it's the zero bias, bias threshold voltage, and those are the two parameters we're going to specify. So we'll type KP, and then we, uh, we're going to use uh, 0.15 as specified by the problem here, and a threshold of 2 volts. Now we save and run the simulation, and once uh, the simulation is done, probe shows up, pops up, but the plot is empty. If we hit the insert key, uh, or under the menu trace add, this menu or window pops up where it lists all of the uh, 
node uh, voltages and branch currents and things that are available for plotting. We, there's an edit box down at the bottom. You can type directly into there or you can select things in the list. On the right are some formulas, some functions that are available that you can use in combination with the various uh, voltages and currents that you might want to plot. We're going to plot VI, uh, so that's the input voltage. So there's an offset of 1 volt and then it's swinging plus and minus 100, uh, 10 millivolts around there. We're then going to add VO and now we see VO is centered around the zero because of the output DC blocking capacitor and has a much larger amplitude. So now we can scale, we can subtract one volt from the input to take off the offset and then we can actually multiply it by minus 100 and it appears now that the, uh, uh, the waveforms are nearly overlapped, not quite. Let's go look at our analysis and see what we predicted as a gain. So the gain we predicted was precisely 100 volts per volt, and we are not quite seeing that here. We're a little bit less than that. So we're going to try to figure out where that is coming from. I'm looking through the parameters for the MOSFET and wondering whether there's some other parameters that by default uh, add some uh, complexity to the model or non-ideality to the model that I might not have had, had anticipated, and I don't see anything. So the other th thing I'm going to try now is one, maybe I have too large of an amplitude and so I no longer satisfy the small signal approximation so we'll run it with just one millisecond at an as an input and uh, see, if, um, see if we have a, a gain that's closer to 100. And we find that it's not any closer to 100, in fact it's uh, found to be 95. So now we're going to look at using what's called AC analysis. So AC analysis um, will actually uh, take one of your sources, one of your voltage or current sources, and turn on a small sinusoidal signal. You can specify the amplitude and it will uh, run small signal analysis of your circuit at uh, each frequency over a range of frequencies uh, spaced either linearly or logarithmically and then you get a plot of your circuit response as a function of the frequency that excited the circuit. So the way we specify is the AC analysis is we use the command dot AC. We specify the sweep type and here there's, there's linear, uh, octave, and decade. We're going to use the decade logarithmic sweep. So there you specify uh, the uh, you specify the number of points per decade, the starting frequency, and the ending frequency. So here we go. Decade. We're going to do 20 points per decade. We're going to start at 0.1 hertz and go to 100 kilohertz. We can leave the transient analysis in there. It'll run both of them. And then we have to specify which source is going to actually have the AC excitation. So VI is where we want to apply the AC excitation. Although we have specified a sinusoidal excitation for the transient uh, simulation, when you run AC analysis, it's not going to use that function. If we'd specified our VI to be a sine or an exponential or a piecewise linear um, or any other function that's only used for transient simulation. To use uh, or to specify a, a, a signal for VI for the AC analysis, we put in the keyword AC and then we put in the amplitude. So we're putting in a very small signal. It's uh, one millivolt. When we run transient analysis, the AC one millivolt here will be ignored and it will just use the sine definition. When we run AC analysis, it will ignore the sine definition and use just uh, AC. In fact, when we um, specify a voltage source such as VDD and we, we say 30 volts, uh, we could be more explicit and actually type DC space 30 volts and it would be used for the DC analysis. But uh, if you leave the specif specifier off, it assumes that this is for the DC case. So now we have uh, an AC or transient uh, analysis to pick from. We select the AC analysis and now we're going to plot VO divided by VI. So we'll get this ratio. And sure enough, we see that the ratio of the output to the input is 95. It's not 100 as we uh, expected. 
Another thing just to, to show of interest is that if I reduce the input and output uh, DC blocking caps from 100 millifarad to 1 millifarad and rerun this, we see a different response now. We actually see that the uh, the gain really rolls off down to zero. See, it's, a hun it's 95 and then it goes down to zero at the, when we get down to a millihertz. And that's because those capacitors no longer look like a short at uh, the lower frequencies. We can plot this on a log scale versus log scale, and now it looks like a straight line. And we'll uh, explore those kind of plots more later. Uh, they're called Bode plots, Bode frequency plots. We're going to return the caps to uh, their uh, previous value here. Well, I guess I did 10 mil, so there's a roll off. Uh, I, there are 10 millifarads at, uh, for the input and the output, and you see that below about, what does that look like, 10 millihertz, uh, the, uh, the gain drops off from, from the uh, higher frequency gain of 95. We still don't have 100 gain, though. We want to get to 100 gain to understand why we don't actually have that. Here I've turned on some cursors so we can actually check and exactly, uh, we, we find that it is exactly precisely 95. Uh, the cursors, you notice the cursor that I have here is a floating cursor. It's probably not the default cursor that you're going to see when you run SPICE. This is actually the old cursor that uh, was in the previous, in an older version of PSPICE, but you can still choose to use it. The way you set it is if you go to Tools, Options, and then there's a tab called Cursors, and you can check a box that says use the, uh, the old, uh, something like the old cursor, floating uh, undockable cursor tool or something. I like this one better sometimes because it's simpler to use than, than the other more capable but more complex one. So now what I'm doing, I'm trying to find out why we aren't at a gain of 100. I'm looking at the output file and checking the um, parameters that were specified for the transistor. Perhaps there was something there that uh, I uh, that is non-ideal that I had uh, overlooked and I don't see anything there so we're going to uh, go back to our, uh, oh, this right here is a key. The voltage at the drain, the design, uh, I recall, was to bias the circuit up to 15 volts, which was halfway between uh, ground and the supply voltage, but it's not 15, it's actually 16.4, and now this makes me wonder if the resistor values I've chosen for my biasing, the biasing the gate, are incorrect. So let's go back to our analysis and see what we had actually calculated. We had calculated that R2 was 2.2 over 30 and R1 was uh, 100K minus that, and we had approximated that as 7.3K, but it turns out uh, that 2.2 divided by 30 is actually 3 point, or 7.333K. So we are not using the exact value of resistance. So let's go back to the net list and update our R1 and R2 uh, definitions. We'll run the AC analysis again, and now, lo and behold, uh, we get precisely a gain of 100, uh, exactly as the theory had predicted. Let's check this in the time domain as well. So we're going to uh, increase the amplitude of our sinusoid at the input to 10 millivolts and run the simulation again. This time we're going to look at the transient response. And uh, we see that, uh, in fact, the gain is precisely minus 100 as the waveforms are indistinguishable from one another. Okay, the last thing I want to show you is uh, how you can run multiple simulations using the step function. We're going to do a parametric sweep. So I had defined the R load before the resistance of RL as uh, having a value of R, R load and then defined a parameter of R load. Now I put in a step command where we're going to iterate on a parameter value, the value being R load. And you can you can sweep it linearly, logarithmically, or you can define a list, which is what I've done here, just 10K and 1K. So now we'll look at it in, time, in the time domain, and it shows you the data from both. So we see uh, the output when it's 10K, the output when it's 1K. And you can see that the, the output decreases when it's loaded to 1K. We'll load this again and look at it in the frequency domain. And now you see very clearly that we had 100 
gain of 100, and then I think that's a gain of about 25. So now I'm going to expand this, and we're going to run the simulation for uh, 100K, 10K, 1K, and 100 ohms. We'll look at the AC analysis again, or the, the frequency response, and we see uh, four curves. When we turn on the cursor, we can click on each one by clicking over on the icon uh, corresponding to each curve, and we see that it's they were on 146, um, gain of 146, 100, a gain of 100, a gain of 25, and I think lastly it's about a gain of 2 or so. We can look at this in the time domain as well. If we plot just V out, you can see the significant difference in the output voltage as the load resistance decreases. Now the last thing I'm going to do is just to show you how when you have multiple you have a set of family of simulations, uh, if you just say if you plot VO, it's going to give you the family of curves. If you want to just plot one of those, you can use the uh, syntax of V, uh, like VO, and then the at symbol, and then one, two, three, four, corresponding to uh, the element in your uh, step. So here, because I have a list and I have four elements, if I do at 2, it's going to correspond to when our load is set to 10K. Before closing out, we're going to do two last things. One, I want to show uh, the main voltage signals throughout the uh, amplifier, specifically VI, VG, V drain, and uh, V out. And so we're going to run a simulation again with the 10 millivolt amplitude. And uh, we'll have to put the at 2 in each case because uh, the, the parametric sweep was being run here. So what we have is uh, the VI, um, V, uh, which is the, uh, the first signal that is just slightly above uh, 0 volts. There. I think I have an offset of 1. And then the blue is uh, VG, and it's biased up according to R1 and R2. Then uh, VD is the one that's the, at the highest voltage there, sitting around 15. And uh, VO is then the largest signal centered around uh, 0 volts. So now let's actually zoom in on uh, VG, the gate voltage. And we see that it is centered around 2.2 volts. If we go back to our analysis, uh, the predicted uh, VG that was needed to bias the output up to 15 volts, one half of the 30 volt rail voltage was a VGS of 2.2 volts, and that's uh, indeed what we have. Now the last thing I want to do is to see what happens with this amplifier if we incre increase the uh, input signal amplitude from 10 millivolts to 100 millivolts. So if this is a gain of 100, minus 100, then we should see uh, output amplitude of minus of, uh, 10 volts. So we're going to look at this in the time domain. We'll plot V out. And here we see that uh, some uh, some of the signals have actually bottomed out, and even those that haven't have some significant distortion. Turns out that although we overdrive the input and therefore clip the output, uh, if we load the output significantly enough, if the resistance, the load resistance is small enough, we can avoid um, distorting at the output or clipping at the output. Finally, let's look at the drain voltage to see if we can understand why the clipping is occurring. Sure enough, we can see that when the load is light, in other words, higher resistances, that uh, the drain voltage goes all the way down to zero, which means the transistor has left saturation and entered into the triode region.